All right, everybody, welcome back to our Palo Alto studios. We're live here at SuperCloud 7 and unpacking the next data platform. My name's Dave Vellante. I'm super excited to have an elite analyst panel. Sanjeev Mohan is in the house from Sanjmo and a CUBE Collective member, Rob Streche from the CUBE Research and George Gilbert as well from the CUBE Research. Thanks guys for coming in today. Great Thank to see you. you. Uh, we have some fresh data that we want to unpack that we broke uh, this weekend on breaking analysis. Rob, thanks for helping us you know, construct that survey. Shout out to the folks at, uh, at ETR. But I want to start off our second guest today, Jamak Dagani, beautifully laid out, uh, George and I had interviewed her last week, beautifully laid out the complexities of today's data pipeline. And essentially her premise was, we're going to try to be in the middle of that hourglass that she showed. I don't know if you've seen that, those slides, but basically the data stack and kind of the choke point of all these different, we call it choke point, she didn't like that word because she was being <laughs> politically correct, you know, she's a startup now. But, but all those governance catalogs and those different standards, she's trying to containerize that whole thing, essentially be the docker of that world. You're seeing some challenges with that. Let's have that conversation that we started to have off camera. What, what's your concern about that? So I, I'm a big supporter of data products. I think that is the biggest outcome, significant outcome of this entire data mesh four principles, that's a standout in my opinion. But containerizing a data product while data product adoption is still in motion, I don't see, I, I'm not seeing that far ahead. And Jamak's amazing in her vision, so I, you know, kudos to her, but I saw the entire dockerization or containerization of the infrastructure not pan out that well. It, it's pretty well accepted, but the company as such, Docker, didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. So having a company around this concept of containerizing data products, I think is a step uh, in the future that we have not yet arrived. So very useful, but maybe not a business model. What, what do Correct. you think about that, George? I, I don't disagree with that. And, and I don't think Jamak would disagree with that necessarily either. The, the, the folks at Docker did not have a business model. Mm -hmm. and, and she was not claiming um, that she was building a big business around this. What she was saying was that by having enough metadata around each data product, you would be able to have alternative metadata catalogs created so that the choke point would no longer be like a unity or a horizon. So you wouldn't that have to make that choice, that trade off. Yes. So you can think of it as CI, CD for data products. Yes. I think what she was aiming at yes. versus containerizing them. And I, I think it's a slight difference in that. And I, I think, you know, again, when you look at how CI, CD and how you can break data products, and you know, we've talked to multiple mm -hmm. people here on theCUBE where you talk about how that metadata gets siloed to that exact point and how you're trying to share it across different data products. Because if you want to describe a company and revenue in a company, you want it to be you know, the same across all your data products and all your data apps and all your data features that are built underneath that. And I think that is where the complexity comes in where you have data silos and how you keep that metadata in sync across yeah. all of that. So, so Rob, uh, some of these problems have already been solved. If you look at Roche Pharmaceuticals, because Roche comes up a lot in the data products yes, discussion, yeah. they have hundreds of data products and they've been doing it for the last two years. They have the entire CI, CD uh, tool chain. In fact, it's so robust that when they introduce a new product, whether it's Immuta or it's uh, Monte Carlo or whatever it is, it must be compatible with their data ops product, which is data ops life. So that's one point. The second thing uh, to your point, this whole notion of cataloging metadata is actually quite, it's a little bit of a new thing, metadata catalog. We've had data catalogs, but why does it need to be something new? It should be part of existing data catalog. All the metadata for data products, the KPIs, the usage of that, all that, in fact, we can even think of this function of a data catalog as a data marketplace yeah. or a data product hub, so. Yeah, 
I, I, let me just add to that, that you're talking about, I think, the discovery aspect, the discovery function of the data, yeah. data products and the metadata yeah. needed for the discovery Data function. discovery for your point and built for yeah. Rob's point. And so yeah. so yeah. just to build off of it and kind of bring it back to what we saw in, in actually in the survey was the fact that when you start to look at it, I think there's, there, and Roche is far ahead of Correct. the vast majority of right. organizations are. And I think one of the things that people are trying to figure out is, do we have a centralized, a distributed, or something like a federated data, metadata, and, and whatever you call it, catalog mm -hmm. or what have you, and how do you bring that together? And, and I think what people have been looking at is, who owns the data, who, you know, how does it get used, governed across all of these different, and how do you make it attributable so that you know, again, when you're going and using it, that it is authentic and genuine and secure. So, so let's that. zoom it out yeah. a little bit. For this. So the, 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 the modern data platform as we know it today, Snowflake separating compute from storage, Ali Goetze is very fond of saying, look, don't give your data to any vendor, including mm -hmm. us, allow any compute engine to come to any data. And so we're, we call that the next data platform. You know, George and, and I have talked about this a lot on breaking analysis. You and I have talked yep. about it a lot as well. Yep. Um, and so we went out and did a, a survey. Rob helped write the survey. The guys at ETR found uh, 105 joint Snowflake and Databricks customers. Um, they've got more than that. They've probably got 500 Snowflake customers and maybe 300 in their, in their corpus. Uh, but we just wanted to focus on those joint customers to find out where they were uh, with open table formats, what they were thinking about governance, how they thought about trading off Snowflake and Databricks, and when, what they were thinking about in terms of Gen AI. So we have some data. Yeah. I'd love to put the data up for our audience and then get your guys' reactions. So this first slide, uh, on a scale of one to five, how much do you agree or disagree with the following statements? This shows the percent of customers choosing four or five, meaning they agree or strongly agree. Um, we won't go through all of these, but the first two basically said security and governance before all. The second group here was basically say, we don't want to be locked in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are, those are challenges for customers as we saw Sanjeev, you and I at breakfast at Snowflake Summit this year, we're talking to customers, are you excited about open table formats? Yes, very yeah. excited. How are you going to govern them? Well, I don't really know. Yeah. Okay, now yeah. all the way to the right, and I'll we'll let the audience uh, at their leisure go back and, and check these different answers, but the, all the way to the right is the swing vote. There's 14% that said data security is less important than creating a stack that allows for rapid innovation. Why is that small? It's only 14%. Why is that the swing vote? It's because ETR correlated that and found that those were the ones that were most likely to, to, to switch, to dump Snowflake and move to Databricks as an example, mm -hmm. because they're saying, damn the torpedo, torpedoes and governance. The leftmost, that you would think that's an advantage for Snowflake, our blue blanket, come on in, everything's safe. Uh, the lock-in avoiders would obviously be a, an advantage for the Databricks narrative. George, you have a comment. Dave, I ha yeah, two, two comments on this that tie into interviews we've done. One, um, when, when you talk about open table formats, then you are essentially having to start abstracting governance from the purview, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, <laughs> unattended. of any one vendor. You have to start thinking purview about- Purview is Microsoft's uh, option here, right? So good. You have to start thinking about governing all the data in your data and application estate. And, and that is something, so th this is an aspect we haven't really um, explored before, which is Snowflake's Snowflake's appeal was, hey, we'll take care of governance. You bring whatever tool you want, go through our engine, and it's all seamless. And then they were like, we'll extend that to all iceberg tables and we'll, you know, we'll synchronize governance to the Polaris catalog so you have governance across your Snowflake data and your open iceberg data. And what we talked to um, Rohan Kumar from Microsoft about a purview was, oh no, you want to set policy and tag all your data across not only your Azure data, but across clouds, on-prem, edge, and you know we'll author the policy and, and then you set the tags. So no one governance rules them all, yeah. right? Is there really the message there? But that's part of separating, when you separate you know, compute from data, that means governance is no longer the, the belonging to the engine that said, we'll take care of governance. Let me say it differently. The, 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 the source of control is shifting from the DBMS yes. to the governance 
catalog. Yes. But the source of value isn't necessarily shifting because it's being open yes. sourced in so many cases. But we were saying the governance catalog was either Horizon or, or um, Databricks Unity. Uh, yeah. And it may be, what Rohan told us, actually I think he told us off camera afterwards, that you can set policy um, for those across catalogs. Yes. And it's not there yet with Unity, because it turns out Unity is read only to anyone except Databricks. Um, so in other words, that's still, that's a choke point. That's what Jamak was talking about as a, print, as a choke yeah. point. Sure. But let me just add one thing quickly on the, on the uh, swing vote. I think that's the, the reason that was a Databricks centric um, swing vote is because the data scientists need to pull data from anywhere, regardless of the governance, because they say, I need features from here, features from here, and then I'll look at, you know, what does this turn into a model? They're the, they're the cowboys. So when Ali Goetze says, don't give your data to, to any vendor, including Databricks, his answer to that is open table formats. Use open mm -hmm. table formats, bring, may the best engine win. Mm -hmm. So no, if you bring up the, the second slide here, uh, we, can, we can see here that we ask customers, are you using or intend to use any open data formats such as Hootie, Iceberg, or Delta? 70% said they were evaluating. Only 30% said, you know, no, we have no intent to use. But only 15% said we're using today. But 70% are sort of in that open mindset. And if you go to slide three, Noah, if you would, the next one, you, you get a sense as to what's out there. So you can see a lot of options. There's, there's interestingly, Hive, First of all, other is the, the number one. Yeah. And other could be AWS, it could be you know Glue, it could be Microsoft, it could be or they, Reboot, or whatever. Or we don't parquet. know. Could be Parquet, yeah. Yeah. very Which likely Parquet. Which is not really parquet. a table yes. format, but, 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 yeah. but we asked the question, right, uh, which uh, data lake or open table format. So it was, it, it was open to, yeah. okay. to those. Okay. So, but, so probably is Parquet. But then a lot of Hive still around. Yep, yep Hadoop still around. Then you can see Delta, Hootie, but Iceberg, is the, the highest 40% plan to use Iceberg. And so this sets up a really interesting dynamic uh, with Databricks acquiring Tabular, mm -hmm. Ryan Blue and his co-founders wrote Iceberg. And so again, it's, it's all over the place. You have a lot of different formats. How should customers think about guys um, navigating through all this complexity. Maybe Sanjeev and Rob, you guys could weigh in. Yeah. George as well. Yeah, if you want to go. Yeah, so I mean, I think what people are looking at is they, they feel like they've heard this story before, so they're really looking at which direction best fits. Like, again, if you're, you're Roche, you're looking at what can I go and do on top of some of the data platforms that I have now to avoid lock-in, but they're also, I think, trying to figure out how does that map into my governance model, and I think that's not necessarily there yet per se with a lot of them because they, to George's point about uh, the data cowboys and data wrangling and all the other data stuff that you want to get into, you, you really need to look at how do I bring this all together in a coherent way. And I think, again, to George's point, that 14%, when they start to look at it, maybe if they've, they're, they're not, those aren't the ones coming from the BI side and the analytics side as we were just talking with Jeff about from Vast around when you start to look at the BI people who are kind of coming into AI and going, this is the wild west. And we need to put you know, limits on what people can see and how they can use it and how it's defined and all of this structure. And it, it's making the minds blow of a lot of these organizations because they're sitting there going, you know what? We're going to sit here in this one format until we can figure it out or until my vendor says, hey, I'm going to support that because there's enough momentum. So I, I want to say something about that 14% swing vote. So, so I heard, George, you were saying, you know, data scientists uh, want to innovate, so security is not uh, as critical to them. I'm not sure if that 14% swing vote is because of personas or it's because of the type of organization. My gut feeling is in a large organization, irrespective of persona, they will go for the left-hand side, which is security and governance being paramount, irrespective of the use well, case. Well, can you bring up slide four? Um, but if you're a small bring up slide company, four, because uh, Sanjeev, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but this is, you're absolutely right, 37%, the, the largest said, we like the concept of open table formats, but we're not all in until we figure out the governance yeah. model. So that's the left-hand side see. here. 
Um, uh, please carry on. We'll come back to this. Yeah, uh, okay. So this, the second thing I want to say is that right now, if you look at which table format has the most momentum, it is iceberg, yeah. as, as we can see what people have planned. But is it the right thing? I think that is a question which people are not asking. Hoodie was created in Uber to handle streaming data uh, ingestion, right? Updates. I mean, yeah. updates. Fast it, updates. That's what it stands for, yeah. the uh, you. So fast updates. Now, when you see Confluent is doing table flow where uh, uh, payload of uh, topics on Kafka are being written as iceberg tables, Maybe iceberg is not the right choice. Maybe it should be hoodie or Delta. Well, but but Ali's on a mission to unify all those, yes. right? Okay, so that's, so that's exactly we're going to have him on later going, today. Yes. Correct. Right? And we're going to ask him, right. how are you going to do this? Yes. How long is it going to take? Now, <laughs> to George's point earlier, the problem is that these formats are not at all compatible to each other. Uh, so that's why you have read-only views. So if you write in Delta, you are not going to write in Iceberg. That will kill your entire analytics. Non-trivial to unify those. Correct. Right? So. So, so all that compatibility only becomes a read-only. So you have to pick your primary table format, and then you can use Uniform or Apache X table, and you can then right. get read-only. It's kind of like you got to pick your primary cloud, and then you're going to have, okay. Right. So yeah. bring back slide four, if you will. I want to go through, we, we don't have a ton of time here, but this was, which of the following best describes your use of open table formats? We talked about the first one, governance first. The second one is interesting. Look, we got a mix of data platforms and we optimize based on use case. Use case. We're comfortable managing data silos. We call it silos are us. And then you have the third one. Our strategy is to leverage proprietary platforms like Snowflake because they're more integrated and trusted. That 26%, that's a big chunk that are Snowflake loyalists. And then you got the data rebels. That's kind of aligns with that 14%. We're all in. Uh, on ta open table formats like Iceberg. We'll figure out the governance model over time. And then I just want to go one more and then, then we can get your reaction and we can wrap, but go to slide five if you would, Noah. So both Databricks and Snowflake have made big investments to be a platform in which organizations will build their generative AI applications. We talked about the, the source of control shifting from the DBMS to the governance layer but not necessarily the source of value because of all the open source action. Source of value moving to the ability to manage multiple tool chains, inject AI and build new apps. Really that's what this question is about. How much do you disagree or agree with the, or agree with the following statements based on each company's approach? This is again, the four or five. So agree or disagree. Databricks approach is more appealing because of the historical expertise in machine learning and they're more open models. So you got 64% leaning Databricks, 49% leaning Snowflake. Interestingly, 34%, remember, these are joint customers. 34% said hyperscale cloud providers have more capabilities in AI than either Databricks or Snowflake. Dave. So that could be a third, maybe you know, a little blind spot. There's, so there's, there's something really significant in here. And we've talked about this before, actually at the end of, at the Snowflake uh, Summit recap and then in the shows after that, which is the, the, the data platform vendors think they're adding new workloads and expanding their TAM and uh, reaching new personas but what's actually happening is they're bumping up into new competitors. And like Vertex is something Google Cloud, as you know, has been investing in for years and is a very sophisticated tool chain. And um, Microsoft, less mature on Azure AI, but 10 years of investment in Power Platform and has had their, their iPhone moment for corporate developers where not only do they have low code development that spans Azure, Dynamics, and Office, but now by plugging in um, Copilot and Copilot Studio, essentially they can start learning software instead of specifying software. So that number, 34%, the hyperscaler. Significant. That is yeah. actually a whole set of new tools yes. that are coming in that are going after that open data for building applications that the, um, that the data platform vendors aren't always best equipped. Yeah. And Rob, to the serve. ETR data clearly shows that Google's gaining in, in AI, no question. Apple today announced, or yesterday, I guess, to put out a paper, said it's training uh, its new AI capabilities on, on Google. Yeah. Now, it's not a direct comparison, but still, Google has some AI chops to your yeah. point. Go but, ahead. But if you also look, I mean, I don't know that it's one or the other because of the fact that you have Snowflake and Databricks, where do they live? They're in these hyperscale clouds. Yep. They're not on-prem. If you look at some of the other data in there where it talks about 
are you going to move everything off to the cloud? Mm. The answer is no, but they still have a ton of Microsoft SQL, on, right. which is their primary data stores yep. on premise. So I, I think, again, it's going to be a mix, and I think this is why people are looking at it going, okay, how do I bring this data all together? Because some of my crown jewels are not necessarily in the hyperscale cloud, but I want to use Vertex, I want to use Bedrock, I want to go through and go down this path and start to build out my own AI. One of the easy ways to do it is look at Snowflake or Databricks and bring your, bring your data there to do that because then you can leverage these other tool sets that are out there. So I don't know that it's, a, it's in, to, a, to the you know, kind of premise of the whole thing, a zero sum game for any of these, right. but yeah. in particular on this one. A lot of overlap I, I, yeah. between the two, I, I, and you, 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 you believe that will continue. Yes, uh, completely. Uh, when I say overlap, I mean count overlap. Correct, yeah. yes. So if you look at what hyperscalers are doing, it's, it's actually fantastic. All of them now are, are going in for a vertically integrated stack. Mm -hmm. So Amazon was behind, AWS was behind, but now with Data Zone, uh, Glue, they only had Glue as a technical catalog, now they have data zone. So they are on one side, then you've got uh, Google with Dataplex, Gemini being built into BigQuery, so you can just write your SQL statements instead of trying to learn new tools. Microsoft Fabric saying that, uh, that don't go to uh, Synapse and Azure Data Factory and Azure Databricks and Power BI, it's all just one pane of glass and you can do everything. So that is where the momentum is. But I, th I think there's another third category that's looming, and that includes OpenAI, Apple, Salesforce, uh, ServiceNow yeah. maybe. A lot you of know? wild cards, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, right, Salesforce, potentially others like you know, UiPath, Salonis, et cetera. Guys, we, I'm sorry, we got to wrap, but, but fantastic. Thank you so much for chiming in. Rob, great job on helping design the survey. And, George and Sanjeev, as always, great analysis, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay, keep it right there for more action, live and on demand from SuperCloud 7. You're watching theCUBE from our Palo Alto studios. Be right back.